The Let's Talk podcast was inspired by the MISD's leadership and empowerment team, or LET for short. Our mission is to ensure that all students, regardless of race, culture, or gender, have an equitable learning environment so they can become the leaders they want to be. And now, here are your hosts, Daniel Norwood and Ted Madden. Welcome to our fifth episode of the Let's Talk podcast. The job of the leadership and empowerment team is making an effort to level the educational playing field from the top down, from a district-wide level to inside the classroom. Today we visit with Gerald Sarpy, principal at Mesquite High School. Uh, he'll tell us what they're doing on that campus to push this initiative. And Gerald is also an integral part of the LET committee. So we'll introduce ourselves the way we always do. I'm Ted Madden, video producer for the district and a 47-year-old white man. I'm Daniel Norwood, social studies coordinator and a 38-year-old black man. And I'm Gerald Sarpy, principal of the Mesquite High School and a 43-year-old black man. And I want to start with this. As a white guy, I've come to learn that every black man has stories about being treated differently or looked at in a certain way because you're, you're black. Do you both mind sharing a personal story about this? Because I think it's instructional for people like me. Definitely. Um, I'll start. Uh, I uh, probably a few, maybe a few months ago, I think it was in June, uh, shared a story on Facebook of a police interaction I had in 2012 uh, with the family on the way back from Corpus Christi uh, with some friends. And I'll, I'll, I'll start it off and just say, obvious, yeah, I was speeding. Uh, so, you know, just get that one out there. Uh, my friends reminded me after I shared it on Facebook, they said, Daniel, I think you were speeding. I said, yeah, 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 okay. You know, officer comes to the window. Uh, you think it's a, a normal traffic stop. Uh, and he mentions in our conversation after I've given him my, my registration uh, that I had a front tag missing. Uh, and then he goes back to the car, comes back. And one, I'll, I'll go ahead and put this out there. Never had a warrant, never been arrested, never, you know, committed a crime uh, of that nature uh, other than speeding. Uh, but when he came back to the car, he asked me to step out. Uh, and you know, instantly, my family is kind of like, whoa, you know, and friends are like, whoa, what is that about? Uh, and me, and I didn't even think about it at the time, I just stepped out. Uh, and I'm, I'm a calm guy, and most guys, most folks who know me know that. Uh, but, you know, he called me to the back of the car and proceeded to lecture me about the tag uh, and just, you know, a number of other things in discussion. And I thought, why did he ask me to step out of the car? Uh, and so anyway, long story short, tells me I can go back, gives me a ticket, get in the car, we drive away. Uh, and for most people that may think, Hey, that's, you know, why is that a big deal? Um, but you know, when I think back on it, after I see the, the, the situations with Philando Castile, uh, Jacob Blake, you know, any, any of these, these incidents that we see, um, I think back to why was I asked to step out of the car? If that's a, a, a more dangerous situation, honestly, uh, and so what I've said as I've gone through the book study, as we've had our meetings with the LEC committee is that, you know, it, it's important for guys like me, like Gerald, people like us to, to say what we've seen and what we've experienced. I've probably been pulled over 20 some odd times in my life. I've been asked to step out of a car, uh, probably at least five. Uh, one of which I was asked, questioned in the back of the car my girlfriend was asked to get out separately. She was questioned in the back of the car. Neither of us had committed a crime. Uh, and, you know, when you think of those situations, I had another friend that I was talking to that I grew up with who was white who said he's never been asked to step out of the car uh, unless he was getting arrested for a warrant, which he had one. Um, you know, not I think it was an unpaid ticket or something. It wasn't, it wasn't like that. But so when, we, when you compare those two stories, uh, you realize that there, there really is something different. Uh, and for those of us who are in education or those of us who, uh, you know, are in a professional sense and, and all of us really uh, as black men to really start sharing that, uh, because then I think you begin to see perspectives change and people say, oh, well, it's not just in this one area. It's not just mm -hmm. in this one part of the country, but this is a real thing. Um, I was about 20 years old. I was attending Texas A&M and I worked a night shift at a, uh, phone company called Econophone. We sold uh, uh, calling cards, so long-distance calling cards, back when mm -hmm. long-distance was a thing. <clears throat> and I'm driving through what I assume is the bad part of College Station, though I don't know what that really is. But I was walk it was the uh, night shift, and I'm driving. 
uh, Baby Blue 1978 Cutler Supreme. My parents wouldn't let me bring it until I'd become a junior. And uh, so I'm driving through, and uh, probably about 9.30, and the police pull up behind me, and so I pull over. And uh, he comes to the to the driver's side window, and uh, kind of at a, 7 o'clock, if I'm, if I'm the middle of the dial, if you will, and uh, he says, you know why I'm pulling you over? And I'm saying, you know, sorry, officer, and he moves up a little further, and when he moves up further, I see he has his hand resting on his gun. And I'm like, uh, uh, no, why are you pulling me over? He said, well... The light over your license plate is out. So it's 930 in whatever we deem to be the bad part of College Station, and I'm being pulled over because the light over my license plate was out. But what struck me is he had his hand on his gun. Now, I'm like, Daniel, I'm if you know me, I'm pretty laid back. I'm relaxed. Uh, at that moment, I wasn't angry. I don't know. I can't even think of the emotion. But what was most dangerous is that I forgot all about the talk that mm-hmm. I'd had with my parents. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting out of the car and going, man, show me. Show me where the license plate is out, where the license plate light is out. So what was disconcerting is that the license plate light was not out. Mm-hmm. It was not out. And I was like, this light? And he said, well, maybe it has a short or something because it was out when I pulled you over. Uh, you know, where are you going? And so, of course, I was like, Man, I'm on my way to work, you know, on the counter phone, so forth and so on. Is there anything else? And uh, and then he was like, no, no. I was like, all right. And then I got in the car and drove away. Um, I think about that because I've not had a lot of interactions with police. You know, I've probably been up, pulled over probably about 10 times, you know. Um, and I've not been asked to step out of the car, thankfully. But I did, in retrospect, think about, man, that was so unwise. Like, you, you've been taught you know uh, not to get out of the car. You know to keep your hands at 10 and 2 or put them on the dashboard. You know to have all of your license plate, excuse me, your driver's license and registration and insurance available. Like, you know all of those things. And I think back at a 20-year-old Gerald who jumps out of the car, and then when I see the things that I would say happening lately but have always happened, Mm -hmm. it does give me pause because, you know, it's it was just unwise. So now from your positions on the let committee and your positions as educators, you know, we can only work with what we've got here in the school district. Mm-hmm. What do we do uh, for you as the principal at Mesquite High School? What do you do, make, do to make sure that your campus uh, doesn't have that type of thing happening? Man, you know, um, I think the first thing that you do is you try to set a culture that says, uh, for us specifically, love is what's most important, and that love has that idea of uh, um, long-suffering, that love has that idea of trying to learn other people's perspectives, and that it has patience involved. And that's something that we talk about with everybody, with our students, specifically with our faculty. And um, I think you really teach that, and I think you also teach with our students how to hone their ideas of leadership and how to hone their ideas of how to use their voice appropriately. And, uh, you know, I was listening to a podcast by Malcolm Gladwell, and uh, he was uh, interviewing Vernon Jordan. And he said, uh, we didn't get angry, we got smart. It was an interesting phrase. Hmm. And it's that idea of going, hey, you know, you have a right to be angry when some of these things happen, and you have a right to be angry when uh, things feel as if they're unfair, but anger can't be the only uh, response. You have to be smart and you have to become thoughtful about how you prepare for these occurrences if they happen. And then, uh, and also thoughtful about how you'll keep yourself uh, in line. So we do, we, we really try to focus on those things and how can we grow our students and how can we uh, help them use their voice uh, in the right way. So you are the principal of you, the Mesquite High School. The Mesquite High School, yes, sir. Uh, I'm more of a Wrangler Nin- Stallion yes, guy myself. It's but, 1902, uh, <laughs> baby, 1946, the Mesquite High School, yes. I give it to you. <laughs> so being one of the first black male principals in the district mm-hmm. I know is significant. Uh, and I know, you know, when you when you walk your campus um, – that that does mean something for the kids on your campus. Mm-hmm. You know, tell me, tell me a little bit more about that. What does that mean for you and for the students? You know, I, for me, um, it was not lost on me, and I know that King Davis, 
mm-hmm. had been a principal at Mesquite High School mm-hmm. before. And so, you know, I was honored just even to be able to be a high school principal. I think that carries a lot of responsibility, which I'm, I'm honored to do that. But I also was not blind to the fact that I was the second black male mm-hmm. principal, you know, mm-hmm. uh, specifically in, in high schools. And, you know, I think the effect for students is, um, for all of my kids, is that it says there aren't specific uh, pathways for people because of their race. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there aren't just specific um, roles that you have to fit because of your race or because of how you look. And as sad as it is to say, I mean, this is uh, 2018 and we have kids who kids who were surprised. We're like, so, yeah, I'm the principal. They're like the principal. I'm like, yes, the principal. <laughs> and I would have visitors who came in the building, uh, some out from outside the district, some from inside the district. I know it's just mm-hmm. it's being cast in a different role. And they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm the principal. And they're like, the principal? I'm like, yes, <laughs> the principal. And uh, But I think it's it does. It shows that let's not fall into what someone has created as these stereotypical roles and tropes for people to, to fall in. And uh, knowing that being able to see um, the difference or being able to see that there are opportunities, it makes it more concrete. It doesn't have to be an abstract idea or someone that you may see on television. It's someone that you bump into at Tom Thumb. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, so I appreciate that. I appreciate being able to, to be that for my kids and for all of my students, not just my African-American students, not just my black students, but for all my kids. When you think about serving the Mesquite High School campus in terms of equity, how much of it is a benefit for you to be on the leadership and empowerment team? And then conversely, how does your experience as a high school principal help out LET? I think it's uh, beneficial uh, because I'm able to hear some other ideas from other leaders and other uh, people on the committee. You know, we have former students on the committee, we have community members on the committee, and we're able to kind of synthesize ideas and just have that free flow of ideas. So that helps helps us to, to do things on campus. Um, I think my voice as a principal on the committee is helpful, and I'm not the only principal there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I think it's helpful because we're able to bring, again, concrete ideas or concrete thoughts to what could be abstract. You know, it's not theory and so when we talk about what are ways that we can empower students to grow, you know, and what are ways that we can help teach them leadership, then these aren't uh, theoretical pieces. These are practical pieces. Uh, and that that has been um, one of the one of the strengths of of the let committee is having so much input uh, on top, you know, from principals, from students, uh, from everybody, from professional learning. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really has. And, and your role as as one of the one of the leaders in the very beginning uh, has been has been great for the group uh, and where we're continuing to go. Thank you. Um, and as I think about your role as a leader, uh, you lead Skeeter Nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that has become a thing. That is. Uh, it is. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. We you, are you, yeah. Skeeter Nation. That's <laughs> right. I said the call and response is real. Um, what is it like to uh, to lead that feeder pattern? And what, what kind of things have you seen or changes have you oh. seen? I'm so proud, shameless plug, so proud to lead uh, Skeeter Nation. Um, but man, I just, I see principals and students and, and, uh, parents, community members. It's awesome to see everyone rally around a, a common thought process, a common goal, and to kind of, to embody, not kind of, but to embody what it means to be Skeeter Nation. You know, the tradition that is, um, associated with that, the, the expectations that are associated with, being a part of the great maroon shadow, as we say. and uh, But I also love seeing the innovative practices of our teachers, of our other principals who are uh, in the feeder pattern and how they're leading their campuses. And and we're not the only feeder pattern, feeder pattern rather, that uh, has mentor groups within its, within itself. But it's awesome to see our the way that elementary and middle school students look at and look up to and learn from our uh, high school students, and regardless of the path that they've they've chosen, we have some high school students, of course, who come down and mentor students because they're a part of our athletic programs or fine arts extracurricular activities. We also have some students who are mentors through PALS and through uh, student leadership, but we have some students who 
go and mentor through Ignite, through a, a program where uh, students who may not have had their best first steps at high school, but who are recovering credit, who are dedicated to try to graduate, and those students even go and mentor. And so I think it's, it's good to see the innovation that comes from our feeder pattern, and I love seeing the fact that, you know, we're going to take all of those stories, whatever that story may be, because that's the only story you carry with you, and how can you use that to better someone else and to empower someone else? You guys are both on the committee, so I'm curious. Uh, I'm sure there's not a one-size-fits-all approach to each campus and each classroom, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there are also some general principles that you're trying to incorporate that, that can be used everywhere. So how do you, you know, I mean, you got, you got the campus, but you're also part of the committee, so you're thinking about different age groups, different campuses. Mm -hmm. Both of you, how do you make sure that these messages are specifically designed for each campus and each group of students? I think you start with the foundational principles that you want to establish as a district. Uh, and, you know, we started with our purposes and outcomes. Uh, and within those, you start to look at concrete ways that we can not just help students overcome barriers, but really to affirm them at an earlier age. Uh, and so I, I keep going back to the reading at an early age, uh, which we, we've talked about before. But, um, you know, just the, just the books that students read early on is part of it. Um, professional learning is another part. And so, you know, like with, with Jennifer Morris on our team, you know that if every new teacher coming into the district is receiving this training, uh, I think it's culturally responsive teaching in the brain. When you look at those types of trainings, then you start to set the foundation for uh, what goes on in classrooms and what our teachers know earlier. Because, you know, it's a, there's a lot of teachers who learn this stuff over time. But if you start your first year and you start to see different perspectives on, hey, I, you know, my book collection needs to be very diverse so that all of my students are, are seeing what uh, Rudeem Sims Bishop says are the, the windows and the uh, mirrors, uh, then I think that makes a, a big difference on how those students progress through the rest of their career in Mesquite ISD. Uh, and then by the time they get to Gerald, mm -hmm. they're ready for leadership because they've been affirmed uh, at, at that earlier age. Yeah. Uh, and they're ready for mentorship as well, which I think we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. For people who haven't heard previous podcasts, explain the mirrors and the windows thing. Oh. Yeah, the mirrors, okay, so the mirrors, uh, every student needs to be able to see themselves in the books that they read. Uh, and and that research you know, goes way back. I want to say it was in the 80s uh, that you had, they recognized that there was a need for um, more diverse books, meaning not just books on Harriet Tubman or on Frederick Douglass or on our heroes, uh, and I, I just used the black ones there, but, you know, that not just on on folks like that, but you needed to see just a general kid who lived and looked like you. Uh, and so if you're, you know, if you're a, a seven-year-old uh, kid, you need to see a character in a book who, like I said, looks like you, goes to school, has a normal day. Uh, and the same goes for, for the opposite of that, which is the uh, windows. And so if, if I'm a student who happens to be a white student or a black student, I need to read books that are about uh, Hispanic characters. Uh, or Asian characters, because then I start to see that, hey, there are other people in the world, and there are books written about other people, and they don't have to be heroic. They're just regular people. Uh, and so I think that begins to teach our kids early on, like, you know, we live in a diverse culture, and everybody's valued, uh, because when all the books are either animals, which they determined at one point, or they're white, uh, or they're fictitious characters, uh, then it really tells our kids something uh, as they read those books and they grow up saying, hey, there isn't a book on the shelf about me. Uh, and I think through data, we can even see that kids who are reluctant to read, in some cases, it's because they don't see a book that really appeals to them. And so, you know, we may have a school system that's, that's identifying certain issues with their learning. And to be honest, they just haven't been motivated to go in because nothing speaks to them. Uh, and so I think that's why that's such a big foundational piece. You know, it kind of partners to the earlier question, you know. Uh, yes, I, I'm i a black principal, but that also normalizes the idea of seeing uh, black principals and other administrators. And, you know, perhaps if we had had more window books or mirror mm -hmm. books, then you wouldn't, it wouldn't seem like a novelty. It wouldn't seem like a, a surprise. But to go along with what you were saying as far as uh, the the LET committee, 
And one of the things I think helps is that it fits into other parts of our culture. And so you're right, we can't, we can't uh, create a one-size-fits-all approach at all, but because we as a district focus on capacity building, because we as a district focus on distributive leadership, then you're able to uh, have conversations with school leaders and teachers and, and, and students and say, here's an issue, here's a concern. All right, what are some ways that we can address this concern? Uh, and let me see your innovation come out of, uh, be born, or let me see what's born from your innovation as we address this concern. So it's not something that is a top-down approach that says, if you follow these steps, then we will eradicate all of the obstacles and inequities in Mesquite ISD. But more so, it says we're capacity builders, that we partner with professional learning and we encourage uh, students and teachers and faculty to read and to lean into the discomfort of learning some things uh, about inequities and obstacles that are uh, there for all types of people, number one. And number two, then own that piece. Own that piece on your campus. You know, if you say the question is, how do we help to hone and strengthen students' voices toward action and to be used well, we don't need to try to uh, determine what that looks like from the LET committee. What we need to do is to make sure there's a safe space to ask the question and there's a safe space for the folks on their campuses to answer the question and then put it in action. We're still very early in the school year. It, class is just open to students last week. Yes. So when can we realistically start working with teachers and administrators on these issues versus just getting the school year going. Right, right. If you think of it as another thing, then it becomes difficult, right? If you consider the idea of removing obstacles for students as part of what we do every day, and then knowing even more so that we may have a limited approach to what we can do to mitigate the factors of COVID in general, but you know, we see inequity pop up as we have to deal with COVID. You know, we see inequity pop up in obstacles, and, I, and I'm going to use both of the words interchangeably right now. We see those obstacle, obstacles pop up uh, by who can choose to go VLA and who doesn't, by who does op- have the opportunity to come face-to-face uh, and who just actually cannot. You know, I don't think about some of my high school students. I have students who have uh, full-time jobs now. And because of the structure of VLA, it affords them the opportunity to be full-time providers to help at home and to also be full-time students to uh, to try to continue to build a future for themselves and, and be successful in high school. And so it's not the idea of another piece, but it is, it's another lens through which we look at how we teach, how we act as administrators, how we encourage it's another lens. And so when that lens is, I want to empower you to knock down your obstacles as well, then that that's the piece. That's how we go through and we ask, how do you have one more thing? Well, it's, it's not the thing. That's like saying another drop of water in the ocean. This is, this, is, this is the medium through which we are providing instruction, providing education. And then you touched on something earlier, too, on the safe spaces for conversation. And mm-hmm. I think that being kind of the bedrock of of what we did with the let committee and having our three students feel free to share mm-hmm. uh, I think was was huge because that touches on it becomes part of the culture yes. like like you said uh, of of leadership that we have in the district not just from the perspective of the principals but also from the students and mm-hmm. what they can say and what they can tell us uh, and I think as we look at equity and overcoming obstacles it if, if you have that safe space for conversation, you'll learn so much more about perspectives. Uh, and I think that's the one of the keys to, to making any of the type of organizational changes that we're looking at is it's the various perspectives and making that space available because it doesn't always happen. Uh, right. And I think in Mesquite, we're seeing right now that, man, there are a lot of people opening that space up on their campuses, uh, open that, opening that space up for their kids also. Mm-hmm. And I just think about if the standard is – uh, let's remove these obstacles and let's improve these inequities, then we everything else can be on the table. And that's hard to do. That's hard, it's hard to put long-held beliefs on the table. It's hard to, to uh, put the way you feel and, and look at that according to data. You know, it's hard to put those things on the table. But if the idea says that we're going to be a place that 
values equity, that we're going to be a place that removes obstacles so our students can be as successful, so they can have the, the ability to choose their future, then that's, those are the things that create safe space. Last one, uh, and I want to I wanna touch on something that I know is very important to you. Yes, sir. Uh, and I know it's, uh, if, golly, right now, I think as we look around, we're going to see AKAs of the world uh, putting their green and pink <laughs> on everything uh, as we see the you know vice presidential nomination of Kamala Harris. Mm-hmm. Uh, but fraternities, yes, sororities, they play a major role in the lives of uh, college-educated people, uh, specifically in the black community. You see it a lot uh, in, in the offices of um, counselors, leaders, teachers. I, I see it everywhere. That's right. Um, can you tell us about the importance of fraternities and sororities and why students should consider pledging? Oh, man. Uh, man, I need a different show. I need another <laughs> show. No, uh, you know, very, very important. Let me first start off by saying I'm a proud, proud member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, um, the royal blue and the purest of whites. And those of you <laughs> who know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But it is a uh, a great avenue for leadership. You know, when we, let's talk about some practical things. It's a great mm-hmm. avenue for leadership because you're going to be put in positions that you have to lead people, have to lead your fellow uh, college students, which, man, that that's a very difficult thing to do, where you are an example of what should be um, elite and what should be example worthy. You just have this this opportunity to make such a great impact, one of the things that we say, um, and it's true, is that you you can see it, that the letters, if you will, are more of a magnifying glass, that they don't change who you are, but they illuminate and they bring uh, sight to who you are. And so because of that, you're representing more than just yourself. You're representing, for me, over 100,000 members uh, across the entire world, you know. And, uh, and I also think back at some of our previous civil rights leaders, great leaders in our history. I have been members of uh, black Greek letter organizations, you know, so in our, cam- in our campuses, we have very, very, very lots of uh, members. I would start naming names, but I'm going to forget some people, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but, uh, but we have these great leaders on our campuses, and I know that they bring the experiences uh, from being uh, in fraternities or sororities with them. Thanks for the conversation. Oh, man, thank you. I appreciate yeah, being great. here, man. It's That's awesome. Great. That's Mesquite Principal Gerald Sarpy. Next week, we'll visit with Jennifer Morris, the district's director of professional learning and a member of the leadership and empowerment team. For Daniel Norwood, I'm Ted Madden. Let's talk again next week. <laughs>